We're going to talk about the debate that Lex Friedman hosted on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and it was held a, a week ago, really a day before, two days before uh, Ilan was on the show before. And it, we were planning to talk about that if we had enough time, but it was just, it came out too too close to the time of the show. Uh, so we, we decided to do it this week. Uh, talk about this debate that Lex Friedman put on. Uh, it's to give you a sense of this, it's being watched now, last time I looked, by 2.3 million people. This is a five-hour debate. Now, 2.3 million people, I, I'm guessing most of them didn't watch the whole five hours. That is quite a task to, to watch the whole thing. Uh, but, uh, but just to give you a sense of the influence this has, it also had some pretty influential people in the debate. That is, people who are regulating the media and regularly uh, discussing these issues and debating them in different uh, formats. Norm, Norm Finkelstein, I think his name is, uh, and um, uh, Rubini uh, who represented the pro-Palestinian side, and uh, Destiny, uh, and um, Betty Morris represented the Israel side. And, and we'll talk about each one of them, I, I think both in terms of how they did in the debate and everything else. But first, uh, <laughs> hi, Ilan, I forgot to say hello. Hi. Good. It's good to have I'm, you I'm, back. I'm glad to be back, but I have to say I, I regret agreeing to watch that whole thing. I didn't know it was going to be five hours, or if I did, I didn't realize how bad it, it would be to watch it. But there's a lot to talk about here. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, there really is. And and yes, I, I mean, I listened to it. I, I started on one and a half times speed, but some of them talk so fast. I think Benny Morris and, and Destiny talk really fast. Norm Finkelstein, you can actually put it up to 2x and, and it's fine because he's talked so slowly. It drives me, it drove me nuts. But um, so I landed up on 1.25 speed. It still was like four hours. Um, and uh, it, I mean, it wasn't the length I've, you know, it was, it was just a, it was, it was just a terrible debate. I mean, you made the comment before we came on, you kind of said, was it even a debate? Like say something about what what in in terms of kind of a big picture. Yeah, but my bottom line wants. is yeah. My bottom line of this is for people really trying to understand the issue. This is not a good guide. It's actually counterproductive. And unfortunately, I, I didn't. I don't know a lot about Lex Friedman. I know you've been on his show a couple of times, and I I like the fact that he looks for interesting people. I I think he's he's he didn't seem very satisfied with it. And I can understand why it was just not a good exchange. So why was it not a debate? Typically a debate, there's some concrete question or specific question or position that you'd say, okay, you're taking this side. I take that side. Or we challenge the question. We, we disagree that this is a valid proposition and then you go at it. it. But this didn't have any of that. It was much more of a facilitated discussion that in practice, became a shouting match and a pretty vitriolic uh, sort of ad hominem level attack in many places. And I, I was embarrassed for the people involved. I was embarrassed for Lex Friedman. I don't know if this is typical for his podcast. I only listened to a few episodes of his. No, I mean, that's not anything I've seen. It's not at all typical. But, I, you know, my response was that was a little different in the sense that I think I would have been more vitriolic, <laughs> maybe less at hominem because I don't know these people. Yeah. But, but uh, uh, you know, I, I think there was way too much letting people say stuff that was completely nuts, yeah. completely moral and completely insane and never calling them on it or not calling them on it with the kind of moral firmness that they that the comments deserve. There was w way too much... Um, what, what I mean, if, Destiny kept asking the other side questions yeah. and he thought he was being smart by asking these questions. And I think he played right into the hand. It, it, it was no. I want to put a few things on the table because yep. I, I think it'd be useful. because okay. it's, it's it's just a, a really sprawling conversation because the topic is difficult and it's a lot of it was very history focused. A couple of things just as over. So my view is it's not very valuable to people trying to understand the issues. It's disappointing. Another observation. So you're I think this is part of what you're bringing up. 
the points on which they really argued vehemently were not the most important points. So there was a lot of back and forth on the historical questions and the claims and counterclaims and what did Benny Morris write on this page and what did he say 10 years later and how did he change his mind and and how do you and the the biggest moral issues just snake by and then as you put it it was really apt which is some of the craziest most irrational most I would have walked out kind of statements. I really, I was, I was talking to my son on the drive home just a little while ago. I, was, I told him like, if, if I were in the room, I wouldn't dignify the, I wouldn't continue because he, he took to give people a flavor of that. The, so, so just the, the moral issues were not what they were arguing about. And they were arguing about often minutia. The second issue, big issue for me is insofar as there was a moral tone to this, it was Rubani and Finkelstein taking the moral high ground from yep. the beginning. And n n the other side, n whether they thought of trying to challenge it, it's not clear. They didn't do anything that would have dislodged that. And the, the upshot is if you asked about, if you really took this as a debate and you asked who won, it's so obviously the side that sort of the Palestinian side and, and, and in a particular way. So you said Rubani comes across, I can't remember if this was, you've already said this or is it before we yeah. went live, but Rubani comes across as professorial, legalistic, detailed, rational. He's the sort of person you would go, if you were a lawyer, you'd say, yeah, I want this guy representing me in court. Yeah. Like he's going to knock the socks off the, of the jury. And he comes across as just the most sensible of the four. And there are two historians in the room. So he comes across as sensible. And what he says is just completely nuts. He says to he says to, at one point he says, "We saw that it took dismantling the Khmer Rouge to get peace in Southeast Asia. We saw that dismantling the white supremacist regime in South Africa required was required to get civilization in South Africa. There's no future peace in the Middle East unless Israel is dismantled." And he then he gets some sort of hair splitting argument about what that really means, and then he launches into the standard position, which is Israel is an apartheid state, it's a genocidal state, it's irrational. And he it, it just comes across as, well, this guy is the only one who seems credible, and this is what he's saying, and he's... So, because he's the only one to take a stand and is, in a sense, radical, right? He, he, he's consistent. He doesn't waver. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's, he, he, he knows exactly what his points are, and he knows exactly what he's after, and he's not going to compromise. And the pro-Israel side was just Finkelstein is like a historian who's, who's, who's nitpicking and, in a sense, disguising his true agenda, which is completely in agreement with Rubini, but he's not going to actually say it because he's too much of a historian. And the Israeli side just comes across, the pro-Israeli side, comes across as, yeah, Israel's kind of flawed and there are real problems with it, but the Palestinians are kind of worse and they had opportunities to have peace, but they never took them. So it's really their fault, but let's not be too harsh on them. And uh, it, it's just, it was, yeah, I mean, the pro-Palestinian side clearly won, I think, the debate to the extent that there's a winner here. But it, but I agree with you, it's not worth watching for anybody who wants to learn about this. This is not the debate to watch. There are many, many better sources and probably better debates than this one. I thought this was very weak. Um, and it's partially just the people you put together. Just to drive home the point of sort of the impact of what I think this debate will have is I think the effect of Finkelstein and Rubani is that they are, the, the effect of their statements and the way they conducted them most of the time, they end up whitewashing the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian movement, which I wish we, we should talk about because there might be people listening who don't already know our views. And they they sanitize what happened. So at one point, and this is near the end. One point Finkelstein says, it's no surprise October 7th happened. These people had no other choice, which is the standard desperation argument about why the Palestinians have a right to, to armed struggle. And Rubani makes the point about armed struggle, which we should talk about as, well, this is under international law. And how could you, it's obvious to me, how could you, it's in, incontrovertible and that's the that's one of the biggest issues, and that that just sna slides by. And what Benny Morris and Destiny, or I don't remember what his real name is, what they what they, I think there are points at which they're trying to make important claims, 
but none of it lands. And it, I think the listener is just going to be completely unimpressed by that. If they're just trying to weigh it, they don't really have a context. And it, so the, it, I don't know what Lex's goal was, but the upshot of this thing is the worry I have is it's, it's going to make the, the, it whitewashes the Palestinian movement. It sanitizes Hamas and it gives the high ground. It sort of builds the high ground even higher. Like it makes their position even more strong than it was before October 7th. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree completely. And and it, it gives legitimacy to, I mean, I find it amazing. The first hour, I think an hour and 10 minutes, basically were all about, some quote that some something Benny Moss had written in the past, where, uh, where and Finkelstein was quoting, and then Benny Moss had revised and expanded, and Finkelstein was quoting, and they were for an hour basically arguing about these quotes and what Benny Moss actually meant by them or not, without even considering the idea, which I would have raised if I was in the room, that Benny Moss is a lousy historian who, uh, you know, so. So I have I have this book. I don't know if you I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, right. Koresh's now. book, right? Fabricating Israeli History, The New Historians. And you should read what I mean, you know, but the people out there, you should read what Frank Koresh has to say about Benny Morris as an historian. So Benny Morris at his best, defending Israel, is still unbelievably weak because he has written lies about the history of Israel that are going to be used against him because they support the Palestinian cause. And yet he's an Israeli and he's the historian that everybody's quoting and everybody's citing these days. Nobody critiques the actual stuff that he says. Um, and uh, the poor Palestinian study just eats it up. Uh, and so for now on 10, they, they talked about transfer. They talked about whether the Israelis or the Zionists intended to kick out the Palestinians from uh, Palestine once they established a Jewish state. That, that was for an hour 10, they talked about that. And it's pretty clear from the historical evidence that while there were certain people within the Zionist movement who did, who wanted to kick the Arabs out, uh, Ben Gurion and the leadership of the Zionist movement basically said, we're going to establish a liberal democracy where people have equal rights, no matter what their religion and everything is. And that point was never really made in this debate. It was kind of, Benny Moss said it a few, but, but without the kind of force that was required. Yeah, so I agree. I, I, I mean, I they, even, they even quoted Herzl out of context. And Herzl, in his whole vision for a Jewish state, is kind of a liberal, he's, pro, he's kind of pro-capitalist. I mean, he's not a capitalist, but he's he's pro-liberal democracy, kind of on the, on, the, on the more free market side of it, for Jews and Christians and Muslims and everybody living in this uh, new city. And they presented him as if he was some kind of fascist. Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a number of things that come up here. So I just want to put on the table the issue that I think at the beginning needed to come up is that I think so to just I think it's useful to have two questions as we go through. So what do they actually say, and what would you have said if you were approaching this differently? And I think our perspective or the perspective that I would bring is you're talking about expulsion. You're talking about trying to make the Zionist movement into this imperialist organ or puppet of the Western powers, which we should talk about. The real question here is, what's the purpose of their their movement? What are they trying to do? And is it justified? So this whole issue of self-determination just goes unquestioned. So the Palestinians had a, quote, homeland, and the Jews had a, quote, homeland, and then they fight over it. Yeah. What is a homeland, for Christ's sake? What is a homeland? That's not a clear term. And I think one of the things you would have to do is think deeply about, does living somewhere give you claim over the land? Now, not a property rights claim, a political claim, where and it's it's un, it's under the rule of an empire, the Ottoman Empire, and then it's under the rule of the, the British under a mandate. There's all of these things, and what was the purpose of Zionism? It, was it to solve a problem that was a real problem, and what was the reaction to that? And they go back and forth. And, and one of the points we I've made and you've made this many times is that when you're thinking about this philosophic issue of What's the purpose of a state? What justifies a state? What justifies any group of people in claiming self-determination? And it, is that always valid, which is the conventional view? And I think the answer is it's not always valid. And it's a very specific context in which you would justify it morally. It's the context in which you're trying to build a freer society or a free society. So it depends on where you start and depends on where you're heading. 
And the idea of a homeland is a inherently collectivist view, which is one of the things I criticize about the Zionist movement and the Palestinian movement. This is not something you have to take, and both sides just swallow this, right? And so then they get into this, whose homeland really is it? So that just, there's a philosophic issue, there's a moral issue, it's not addressed. And I think that's an important gap. And to, to the issue of sort of the, the history that they're going into, and I, I've given a number of talks since October 7th. And one of the things I, I try to impress upon people when it comes up is Herzl was so much more an enlightenment figure. Like he, oh, was, yeah. like he, he, he wanted atheists to be as free as Jews in this country. And one of the biggest criticisms Herzl faced from other Zionists was, you want a Jewish state, where's the Jewish in it? And th that was a big problem for them because there were factions of Zionists who said, well, it has to be really Jewish and it has to be religiously Jewish. And he wasn't keen on that. And one of the one of the anecdotes I share with people is in in his book, Herzl talks about, well, he wanted he was a lover of industry. He wanted this place to be a dynamo of economic power, progress. He wanted it to be progressive in the 19th century sense, not in the 20th century sense, 21st century sense. And one of the things he said was, he's sort of musing, what should the flag look like? And we know the Israeli flag now is the Star of David, which has a sort of religious symbol. But at some point he was sort of sitting around thinking, wouldn't it be cool if we had uh, seven or eight, I can't remember, the seven stars to symbolize the seven hours of productive labor in the day? <laughs> and you could just see how this would rankle with a bunch of Zionists, some of whom are, are, are uh, socialist communists, some of them are hyper-religious, and there's Herzl coming along and telling them, you know what, it's all about production and <laughs> free society and, and intellectual freedom. Now, he wanted a welfare state, and he, so in that sense, he's much more of a social democrat if you had to classify him by contemporary terms. But the idea that you would take Herzl and you would say, yeah, he's an organ of Western powers, and he is he was all about kicking out this other racial minority or this ethnic group, it's just not to, true to the history that I've read. Just it's no, it's, it, it, it's not true to his is um, you know he wrote a journal and there's there's one little passage in the journal where he contemplates the possible need to 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 move the Arab population out, but it's such an insignificant portion, and it's just a contemplation, uh, you know, and they take it out of context and and they make a big deal of it. But Herzl's life is interesting. I mean, here's a guy. Who was uh, born, you know, was born in Austria, and he he lived in Vienna. Completely um, assimilated Jew, so he barely considered himself Jewish. Right? He 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 wanted to become an Austrian. He wanted to be a European. He wanted to be. He had no desire to be Jewish or to be um, or to be anything. And but he he you know, and he and he he faced some anti-Semitism, but he he didn't think it was that big of a deal until as a journalist. He went to he he covered the Dreyfus trial in 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 France and he saw what they did to Dreyfus and the extent the vitriol and this is France France is the land of the Enlightenment right this is France the tolerant you know tolerant say religious toleration and everything and what they did to Dreyfus really drove home to him the idea that the Europeans will never tolerate Jews and that. So for him, Zionism didn't come from his Jew. It didn't come from him viewing himself as Jewish as much as it came from the realization that the world would view him Jewish, whether he liked it or not. Dreyfus, by the way, was a French general or French colonel uh, who was um, a completely assimilated Jew, completely not religious, completely French in every regard, and he was accused of spying for the Germans. And it was clear that he wasn't spying for the Germans, but he, that he was a scapegoat. And they, and the the anti-Semitism during the trial, people, you know, people all over the world commented on it, and and it created a whole stir in France. But it's what awoken Herzl to the realization that the Jews need to figure out how to protect themselves, and that's really the positive essence of Zionism, right? I mean, I agree with you, Zionism is collectivistic and tribalistic to some extent, and it's a negative in those respects. But as a movement for self-defense, it's probably an historical necessity. Yeah, I, I just want to stress an important point that I've become more attuned to over the last few years. And, and it's partly talking to colleagues, but talking to other people. It Thinking about intellectual movements is really difficult. 
And it's one of the things that is not done well generally. So you think about Zionism, I'm stressing that it's it's a package of different motivations, different kinds of intellectual trends. It's still possible, and this is where people fall down, it's still possible to identify an essence to a movement if it has some unity to it. I think Zionism does have that. And I think that the way that I think of it is in, in terms of Ayn Rand's approach, it, it, it's kind of like a package deal, right? It's got different elements. They don't, it's, they're not essentially belong together, but what are they all a response to? What is the unity? I think the unity is there was a real political moral issue that was faced in Europe at this time, late 19th century, early 20th century, which was, as you described it. So I think Herzl is an avatar for this, which is even being fully assimilated as a Jew, you couldn't escape the reality that the whole population would still view you in this category and would have prejudice against you and maybe even worse than prejudice. If you think of, if you just go eastward to the pale of settlement and what they, so the way the Russian uh, um, empire dealt with them, they, they pushed them into a certain area because that's the only place you were allowed to live. And in other places, Jews were only allowed to have a certain job. So there was just systematic uh, ways in which they were and for, you're right in the sense that France was the one of the first places to grant them civil rights uh, and they were much more part of society. And then that emphasizes the problem, right? So if you go to a place where Jews are most welcome politically, yep. and then you get a Dreyfus, because Dreyfus was to the 19, 1905, 1910, I forget exactly the whole span of time. It was to that period what the OJ trial was in the 1990s, if you think about it as a cultural issue. Yep. It, it, Emile Zola, the novelist, wrote this screed called J'accuse, which is, I, I'm a, he was really outraged by this whole thing. And it's famous. And now people use this phrase when they're making a statement. So it, it was just a really critical thing. So when you think of Zionism, it's if you understand it as essentially a response to this political problem and an attempt to find a solution to it, and not all the solutions were right, but it, the, the essence of it is is the is a valid goal, which is a to live in greater freedom. And I think when you see Israel, it, it reflects all the problems of Zionism too. It, it reflects the essence of the solution, which is a freer society, but also a lot of the vestiges, the religion, the collectivism, the mixed economy. Socialism. Of it. Yeah. Yeah, and socialism, which is a big part of it. So in that sense, that it's important to think of it as that, but I think it's the same kinds of thinking about the Palestinian movement needs to be done and they're the same thing. Similar things are true. It's not exactly the same because there's much greater unity of purpose. There's much, and it's not a reaction to an actual problem in the same sense in, in which wanting to be free of prejudice is a reaction to a real problem. And I think that's the crux of this issue. Well, there's a sense in which it's worse because I think that the Palestinian the Palestinians achieve unity to a large extent by killing the people who are not part of the unity. So, you know, anybody, even going back to the 20s and 30s, 1920s and 30s, even people who, anybody who suggested they might be a role for the Jews to play in some future Palestine, or there might be two states or anything like that, uh, you know, was was uh, marginalized and often killed. Uh, you know, the, the 1936 to 39 revolt of the, of the Arabs against the British, the Arabs killed more Arabs then they killed Jews, or they killed, uh, or they killed British, and they killed basically their political opponents. And and this is uh, Husseini, who who the the um, what do you call it, of Jerusalem, the um, the Mufti, the Mufti of Jerusalem, who later became you know if, as, associated with the Nazis. Um, you know, he he basically uh, took power. I mean, it was built from the beginning on authoritarian principles. There was and and on force and coercion. And uh, there was never striving for any kind of liberal democracy or conception of liberal democracy. The initial conception, I mean, the idea of a Palestinian state is a late idea. You know, the original intent, even of the Mufti of Jerusalem, was to Palestine to become part of the greater Arab, you know, for the present uh, with Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and and Palestine being one empire under under the uh, the Hashemites. Um, you know the Palestinian Palestinian self determination was a very late conception, and it was really, uh, I, I think, put together 
because of the failure of Arab nationalism, broad Arab, pan-Arab nationalism, more than because of any desire for a particular Palestinian state.